to feature our percussionist and our very own Mr. Eddie Kojak Barboso. Now, if you look at him, you could probably understand why we call him Kojak. We have one slight difference, though. The difference between our Kojak and Mr. Thomas Vallis, this gentleman has a thing that he really despises, and they'll call lollipops. It is. But he's got a little thing he loves, and it's no chewable. It's called Tootsie Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kojak, what a beautiful tune from Roger Miller, from the traveling people, King of the Road. The man playing drums in this video is my father. Born in Mayaguay, Puerto Rico in 1930, he immigrated to Harlem in 1939 where he immediately became obsessed with the jazz and blues music that was incredibly popular at the time. By the time the 80s rolled by and I was born, he was the fountain of rhythmic knowledge that would help make me the musician that I am today. I'll never forget the first time I saw him play. At that moment, rhythm became everything to me. It was the spark that ignited my passion for music. But there was still so much fuel that would be added to the fire. My mother's family used to tour Ontario as a country bluegrass group, and every single family member played an instrument and or sang. Here's mom and grandpa, doing a duet back when she was a kid. And here's a picture of grandma and grandpa performing together also. Music was a long-held tradition on both sides of my family, and both were equally passionate about their art. Everywhere I went, there was music. Latin music, jazz music, country music, blues music, everything. So naturally, I listened to a lot of music as a child. However, I was too preoccupied with what other kids were doing back then to think about learning an instrument, so uh, it was never really forced on me, I guess. It was always just there. This continued until my early teens. Oh wait, that's a pic of my little brother, Eddie. Eddie Jr. <laughs> oh, there I am. I assure you, I threw up my share of salutes, too. There just weren't as many cameras around back then. There ain't too much to say about my early childhood. I liked video games and ninjas just like all the other kids. My parents separated when I was young and we moved around a lot before we got to Muskoka and started to settle down. My mom finally met the man of her dreams, a big burly hulk of a man that scared the living daylights out of me, which made me straighten up my act in a hurry. <laughs> they got married and we became a family again. Life was starting to make sense to me and I began to think about what I wanted to do with myself. I got into martial arts for a while, and I also began to play the drums, quite aggressively at first. I wanted to be just like Lars Ulrich from Metallica. I played really fast and really hard, and always had a mean expression on my face. Cause you know, that was cool, right? Okay, maybe not. Anyway, for a while it was martial arts and music, with martial arts taking the lead slightly. I'm the Japanese champion now. I held black belt titles in two styles and even won a couple of legit tournaments later on in my teen years. I also learned to play the guitar and started writing my own music for the first time. At first I rigged up an old dual sided tape recorder with a mic input and I, I would record my ideas on that. But then a couple of guys put me onto something that was a hundred times better than that and pulled me into a whole new world of music and technology. I joined a band called Beat Guru, and they showed me how to record and produce my own music with nothing but a computer. I was so floored by that. So as a side project to that band, I began to record my own material. The sound quality was terrible at first, but the songs were there. I used programmed drums and synth because not only was it faster, but the big boomy electronic drums sounded so much better than what I could record with my $10 mic that I got from a thrift store. I called the project ISM after a close friend referred to my many quirks as wan-isms, and I felt that the music represented those quirks. 
This was my experimental phase of music. I'll let it drag out for a second so you can have a listen. After that, I went back to playing metal for a while and recorded a project where, for the very first time, I played each instrument on my own and mixed all of it myself. I called this project Machina, Spanish for machine. Machina eventually transformed into God Eat God, another separate but related project named after a clever Marilyn Manson song title that would be my focus for the next couple of years. Here's a clip of the very first video I ever made, called The Aftermath. fun doing that stuff and I got a lot of demons out in the process. But eventually, I just wasn't angry anymore, so I put it down and moved on to something a bit funkier. Hip hop. I really mellowed out a lot in my 20s, but I still had an attitude problem. <laughs> I had a lot to say still, I just didn't want to yell anymore. So I decided to refine my skill of combining electronic beats with musical melodies and turn it into a new style of hip hop and call myself MC J Wan because my family called me Jay at the time, and my friends all called me Wong. Funk and hip-hop were a natural thing to me musically since I started from a rhythmic background. Here's an early video that I made that shows the basic process I used, and still use today. A lot of people have been asking me, how I get down in the studio and how I make my grooves come up with ideas and stuff so uh, instead of telling you guys I'm just gonna show you so uh, I got my, uh, my recording program ready over here so I'm just gonna click record I'm gonna lay down a drum beat because that's how I always start my beats everything always starts with a beat no matter what um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a drum beat and then, uh, you know, overdub with guitar and bass and I'm going to take you through the whole process, alright? So here we go. Drum tape. 
There it is up on the screen. I'm about to press record here. So I've got my bass in my hand. And I'm about to uh, lay down a bass track for this. So I'm going to hit record. Do, uh, I'm feeling a little bit of a metal, mellow feel off the drums, so that's what I'm going to play. Check this out. I'm going to do the guitar track now, uh, so when I'm done we're going to piece all three together in the studio here and uh, I'm going to give you a final little presentation of how things work together. Soon after recording a large amount of original material, I began to perform live for the first time as a solo artist. It was nerve-wracking, but the rush was incredible. I would get sick before shows and feel like I was high after. It was like drugs, but backwards. After a while, and with the help of the people supporting me, I developed a following. It was my first time dipping my little finger into the pool of fame, and with such a little experience or confidence performing in front of an audience, I began to fall apart. It was at this time that I realized I was living a lie. While the music of hip-hop felt natural to me, the image and lifestyle was the exact opposite. I wasn't boastful. I wasn't from the streets. I was just a funky kid from the sticks that made dope beats. Eventually I realized I was being dishonest with myself and the people around me, and things ended very badly. I have a lot of regrets about that, but I still think I did the right thing for myself and the lessons that would follow shaped me into a much stronger person. The bumpiest stretch of the road was right around the corner. After the Jaywon project came crashing down, I lost all hope. I completely gave up and fell into a deep depression. Nothing mattered. This created a chain reaction that resulted in a dramatic breakup and my departure from the city of Toronto. I lived on a friend's couch in Whitby, Ontario for a while before moving back to the city I was born in. Belleville. Belleville is a small city on the northern coast of Lake Ontario, directly across the lake from Rochester. Returning here brought back a lot of childhood memories and began to rekindle the musical spark in me, that first memory of hearing Dad play. Well, now I was walking past that bar every day. I was right back where it all started, and I could feel that it was time to start over. At this time, I didn't really feel like I had anywhere that was my home, although my sister and her husband were nice enough to take me in and let me sleep on their couch. They were taking care of Dad, too, who at this point was getting older and needed a bit of help. If there was anything that kept me going and inspired me to write again, it was the time I spent with him during this period. Well, that and out of pure necessity. I didn't have a job. I couldn't get any help from the government at first because I had no address. The only thing I could think of was, hey, I can play music and make money. So that's what I did. I found a busking partner and we went downtown and played all the old blues and rock cover songs we could remember. After a few weeks, my performance anxiety was gone, and we began to perform more. We made a lot of money some days too. 
A few songs from the new record were written during this phase, such as Rotten Blues and Addicted to Your Love. But then, financial issues and the possibility of a paying job caused me to move to North Bay, Ontario with another friend. But this time, I got my own room and a bed. Things seemed to be getting better. Then I got the news that Dad had been diagnosed with cancer for the third time. He had already beaten it twice, but this time it had spread through his whole body, and it was too late. When I visited him in the hospital, it was all I could do to fight back the tears. But I knew he wanted me to be strong. So I smiled, and we shared our memories together before we said our goodbyes. He was legally deaf at this point from playing live music so much. So I would just pass him notes, and he would talk. Just before I left, he took my hand and made me promise one thing. It was the last thing he ever said to me. He said, keep making your music, son. And I passed him a note that said, you're going to live forever, Dad. I knew he got the meaning, because he didn't say a word. He just smiled and we hugged and said goodbye. Walking out of that room was one of the most painful experiences of my life. He was my hero, my musical mentor, and the only link I had to my family history on the Barbosa side. He passed away peacefully in his bed, December 2011. During this time, I had returned to Muskoka to live with my parents for emotional support. I didn't do anything for months, but play WoW and party with my friends, who were also musicians. Eventually, we wound up forming a three-piece band called Puddle Hut, and recording some live off-the-floor songs on which I played the drums. I was right back where I started. It was a perfect thing for me at the time to play a support role in the band instead of being up in front and I could feel Dad's spirit there with me every time I hit those drums. I played my heart out on that record as a result and nailed one of the best drum performances of my life. And the whole time, I could hear Dad saying, See, son, this is why you do this. Not for me. For that feeling that we get when we're in the moment and the groove. That's why you do it. And he was right. After the lead singer of Puddle Hut moved out west, I didn't have much to do musically, so I decided it was finally time to set up the old studio again and finish the Belleville Blues album. The working name for this project was Blue Belly, but I would eventually decide that because it felt so natural, it didn't need a name of its own. I would just call it Juan Barbosa. I began writing like a madman, I wrote and recorded my first six songs in a week. I stopped playing video games, and I just made music for that first week. After that, the songs came out a little bit slower, like one or two a week, and then it trickled down to a song every week or two. But every second of recording was like going back to the very beginning of why I did this. Looking at the drawing board and relearning it all over again. Grabbing the best parts from this old project, and the best parts from that one, and throwing away the contrived and the character-based aspects of them. No more acting. This is how I really feel about things, and this is who I really am. I wasn't always this person. I had to learn and sacrifice a lot to get here, and I lost a lot along the way. But I never would have been able to get here if I wasn't blessed with such a supportive and encouraging group of friends and family who sheltered me and helped me back to my feet when I was in my darkest hour. For the past year, I've been preparing for what I think is my finest work and a culmination of my entire journey as a musician. It took me a while to get here, but it really feels like home. And I know it sounds lame, but I feel like I'm ready to take on the world. Bring on the crowds. <laughs> I'll blow their shoes clean off their feet, send them home smiling. I finally got something I want to share with the world, and for once it ain't no comic book version of myself. It's just me. I had some great performances this past summer, 
both by myself and with a new band I'm drumming for called Mud and the Fuck Yaz. And this is just the tip of a very big iceberg. I've assembled a band of killer musicians to hit the stage with me over the winter. The album will be released soon, and I have a lot more planned. But if I told you, it would just spoil the surprise. And I know how much you guys love surprises, so I wouldn't want to ruin that for you, right? Right. So I guess that's it. Nothing more to tell, really. I hope you enjoyed this film as much as I didn't enjoy making it. <laughs> oh, come on. Who wants to have a movie made about their life? Seriously. Okay. Alright. It is kind of cool, but whatever. Anyways, guys. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to visit the websites that will be available at the end of the film. Bye. I mean, oh you... yeah, definitely, um, definitely. Um, but but actually, on the next record, I've got uh, I've got Chris Wagon coming in to, to take over on bass. Incredible. And he just totally gets the sound, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm totally comfortable with him, which is rare um, in a writing environment. And then uh, I've got James Javons as well, who's, who's joining on drums. Okay, good. Um, he's he's a fantastic guy with with a jack. His beard's bigger than mine. So yeah, immediately, yeah. as soon as I saw him, I was like, all right, he's in. He's in. Hope you play drums. <laughs> but it turns out he can. Things don't feel the same. No. So tell me what am I to do? Changing, my heart is growing cold. And when the storm comes blowing, baby, I'll be going down, down, down. Ain't no mystery that I hide. So great.
Yeah. 